Let's see, I don't see anything showing up yet. Oh, there we go. All right, so I want to thank everybody for stopping by and hanging out with me in this live stream. There is about a 20 second, 20 to 30 second delay between what I am seeing and, or what I'm saying and stuff like that and what you guys will see. So if there are, is there anything that happens during the live stream and you want me to just be aware of that as we're going forward, we'll definitely take a look at those issues as they come up. But how's it going, everybody? <coughs> awesome. Thanks, Pete. Good stuff. We will uh, we'll take a few minutes here and uh, awesome, awesome stuff. Good deal. Glad to hear it. So we'll take a few minutes here in the beginning just to kind of go over the what we're going to be covering and all that good stuff because it's kind of important to kind of like level set what we're going to be talking about here before we actually get into it. But so, um, so yeah, the CCNA boot camp, what, what is the goal or what is my goal here with it? And my, my goal with the boot camp isn't necessarily to just uh, force feed anybody, anything. It's not designed to, um, go at such a pace that, you know, you're going along and next thing you know, you know, you, you you've missed something I've said. So there's, we actually are going to have four two hour sessions. This is the first of four. So that's what Crowdcast limits me to is I can only, uh, broadcast live for two hours at a time. So our schedule is going to be from basically one o'clock today or a little after one o'clock uh, p.m. Central to about three o'clock p.m. Central. Then we're gonna take a little bit of a break because obviously I'm gonna probably wanna stop talking for a few minutes. And then we'll pick back up at around 3.30-ish Central time and then we'll finish up around 5.30-ish. So nothing, you know, nothing's locked in stone but I am limited to two hour sessions, which is fine, no big deal. But my goal here is to, as we're going through these sessions, is whatever questions you guys have, whatever topics you guys want to cover that I can provide information on and stuff like that, we will do that. And that's really the goal here is to take my expertise as a network engineer and pass it on to you guys. If there's questions you guys have, whether it's, you know, what's a good uh, reference for this or, you know, how do I remember these commands? And stuff like that is going to be, uh, the answer should be very obvious to you already. It's repetition. A lot of this stuff is going to be repetition. So that's one of the things that I'm going to be big on as we are moving forward and talking about this stuff. I really want everybody to understand that my goal here isn't to force feed anybody anything, right? We have four hours today and four hours tomorrow. And I'm probably going to continue this thing moving forward. So just be aware of that type of stuff. And I'm going to actually mute myself for just a second. So with that being said, uh, anytime you guys have a question about anything, go ahead and put it in the chat. I will keep the chat on my other screen so I can see the, the chat as we're going along. Um, I do ask that you keep the question, if, like if I'm talking about something, if I'm moving too quickly for you, let me know. If I'm uh, if you have a question about something I just covered, um, make sure, just remember that there is a delay between when I say something and something shows up on the screen and when you enter your question. So it might be a minute later that I get the question and I might have switched topics or, so I have no problem spending a, a minute or two, you know, trying to pull, extrapolate the information you're trying to ask for and I can go through that. So with that being said, um, I do have a URL for everyone to download for. I'm going to go ahead and put that in the, the chat. You guys can all download. This is going to be the EVNG and the Packet Tracer topology files. So um, we are going to be building the topology from the ground up. So you and I are going to walk through a semi-complicated, and what I mean by semi-complicated, there's routing and switching that's going to be our main focus so you guys can go ahead and download the 
those files, if you have them, or if you have access to Eve, all that type of stuff, I will briefly talk about some of the ways that you can make Eve work. If you're on a, if you don't have a dedicated server, how you can run it locally on your computer and things like that. But if you have Packet Tracer installed already, I'm not really going to be leveraging Packet Tracer at all because it's so limited. But it's a great tool if you are looking to dive into the technology and you're at the CCNA level. So everybody here, I don't know what everybody's certification levels are. Um, I'm going to guess more entry level. That's fine. I can, you know, I can deal with that. That's not that big of a deal. What I really want to make sure that everybody understands is that as we're moving forward throughout the the different video or the different sessions, is that I'm, I'm not going to be going super deep into any technology unless there's a reason to, based off the questions that I'm getting. So I'm not going to do a deep dive into spanning tree. I'm not going to do a deep dive into uh, layer three routing. My my goal is to look at the blueprint of the CCNA exam and help you guys understand areas that you are struggling with. So if you've taken the CCNA exam, for example, I know there's a couple people on here that have, you've taken the CCNA and you want to get more information out of it, like you struggled in this particular area. You know, something that doesn't make sense to you or you're struggling with, those are the things that I want you to ask me about. And I will be more than happy to try to help you, to try to give you whatever answer I can and, and get you over those humps. So. Don't ask me any questions around, you know, hey, this is, um, if it's not, um, oh, nice. But still feel like a fraud. <laughs> That's funny. You know what? So they have a term for that in the industry. It's called imposter syndrome. And uh, yeah, I can completely appreciate and respect that uh, that look at it. So yeah, I can understand that. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that though. And we have, I have no problem having a chat about how that stuff works. But if you've taken the CCNA and, um, okay, nice Pete. So don't ask me questions that you saw in the exam. Um, if I feel like it's a question that came from the exam, I'm just not gonna, I, I won't answer it. Um, so the question hasn't come up yet, but the, uh, these sessions are recorded by Crowdcast and I will get them and then I will upload them to my YouTube channel. And then you'll be able to I'll label it CCNA Bootcamp Session 1. And then Session 2, Session 3, Session 4, I'll upload them to the up into YouTube. You guys will be able to access them. And hopefully that will uh, be a trigger for other folks to want to potentially join in the future. So, with that being said, I'm ready to get started with this. I want to get kicked off and stuff like that. I'm going to first start off with looking at the CCNA, ex the blueprint, the exam topics, and kind of give everybody a high level of what the exam CCNA is about. I know, you know, I know Mars got his CCNA, and Pete, you're looking to take yours, which is fine. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring over a topology file. So I'm going to go ahead and adjust this real quick, and I'm going to look at the CC. So if you are, uh, I'll show you the manual navigation. Let me switch gears over to my desktop. So basically what you're gonna see here, and I know there's a little bit of a delay, so I'm gonna wait until the, um, yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure you're talking about the, um, because the, the delay about getting the, the videos posted on YouTube. Yep, everything will get posted there. All right, so I'm. What we're gonna basically go over now is the. If you have not already looked at the exam overview or the blueprint for the CCNA, the 200-301 exam, you definitely need to understand what it is that you're going to be going after first and foremost. So there's a lot of material out online for CCNA, and it's one of those things that. Uh, when I was studying for CCNA, there were, I don't know, probably five or six different vendors out there that were going for it. Actually, let me see if I can't get my screen and screen to work real quick. Oh, there it goes. Let me do this. Let me go and make a quick adjustment here to my video cache. Let me turn off my green screen. Cancel. Uh, filters. Go ahead and just get rid of this. 
there we go close all right so um that's coming from this camera here so one of the things that you're definitely going to want to pay attention to when you're talking about ccna is what is going to be covered that's really important so the ccna actually you know what let me go ahead and do this too i did not think about this ahead of time let me adjust this real quick I've got all wrapped up in my green screen. All right, that's better. Sorry, the green screen was just messing with me. Anyway, uh, let me go ahead and adjust the size of me down just a little bit, just so that I'm not so big and taking up as much screen real estate. Okay, there we go. All right, gotta love OBS, right? OBS is awesome. All right, so. Let me go jump over here. If you so the navigation to this would be go to cisco.com. Let me go just and do the navigation real quick with you guys. So go to cisco.com and then you come down here to the learning and certifications. And then you click on certifications right here. And then you look at you can scroll down if you'd like, but or you can just go to view certifications or explore them. I'm gonna go click on view certification exams. And then you go down, you click on the certifications themselves. And you scroll down a little bit and then you have CCNA right here, which is how I got to. Most fun part of it is improvising for an effective outcome. There you go. And then I just clicked on this guy right here and it brings me to this. Now. If you click on the exam overview and you look review the exam topics, you're going to be brought over to the Cisco Learning Network. And this is what we're going to spend a few minutes going over in understanding. So you have a number of topics that you're going to need to understand. So I'll start from the top and work my way down. A lot of this stuff will be pretty basic that you need to understand. So just be aware of what it is that you're diving into. So Never fundamentals, right? You're gonna to need to know the different components, different devices, the different roles of those devices, things like that as you're moving throughout your CCNA journey. So, you know, understand what a router is, what understand a layer two and layer three switch is, a next generation firewall and intrusion prevention system or IPS, what's an access point, controllers like DNA center and the wireless LAN controller, endpoints like PCs, laptops, printers, and then you have servers, right? These are gonna be the components that are gonna to connect to the network. So obviously routers and layer two and layer three switches are gonna be infrastructure devices providing connectivity. Next generation firewalls are gonna do things like, well, deep packet inspection and preventing traffic, uh, preventing something from somewhere talking to something else, so on and so forth. You have access points, you know, uh, providing wireless connectivity, whether it is a autonomous access point, whether it's standalone, you know, most people here probably have a access point that is standalone, meaning that you have to con connect into it and you have to set it up to where it's got a pre-shared key in its own SSID and voila, there you go. And you have the other option of an access point which is commonly referred to as a lightweight access point or an LWAP. And basically the, the idea behind that is I want to not individually control the access point per device, right? I don't want to have to go into AP1 and configure and monitor and administrate it. I don't want to do the same thing for AP2, AP3, etc. Where with lightweight access points, you configure them in such a way to point to a controller, which would be the wireless LAN controller or the WILSI. And the will see is going to be where all the centralized config is, right? You're going to, the access points are going to register with the controller. And then once they have registered with the controller, you're going to go and start pushing like AP groups and the SSIDs and all that type of stuff that goes along with that. Then we're going to talk, a, then you have to think about the network topology architectures. There's a lot of things that come into play with architecture today. And if you talk to anybody that's got, config about you know a two a two tier or a three tier two tier would be commonly referred to as a collapsed core where you have your core and distribution layers are running on the same devices 
And then your three tier is gonna be where you have a dedicated core, a dedicated distribution, and dedicated access layer. So you also have spine leaf. Spine leaf is going to be where you're connecting your leafs to your spines. Now there's a big differentiation here. This right here is gonna be your campus LAN where all of you guys, for the most part, are gonna be studying, right? You're gonna be studying core distribution access or collapsed core where core and distribution are on the same devices. And then your access is always gonna be southbound or downstream of your collapsed core. And then you have the data center. The data center is gonna be where spine leaf is gonna come into play. Spine leaf meaning that you have a spine and a leaf connecting each other together. So your leafs are going to be connected to the spines. Spines will be connected to other leafs, but the spines aren't connected and the leafs are not connected. There are some use cases where the leaves would be connected to each other, depending on what it is you're trying to accomplish. But for right now, we're going to pretend like you're not going to connect your leaf switches. For anybody that's interested in knowing more about that, you can feel free to take a look at my VXLAN series that's on my YouTube channel where we focus heavily on the spine leaf architecture and basically the topology that I'm walking you guys through on the channel is just that it's spine leaf then you have WAN right the wide area network this is a huge topic area because this is going to be where you're going to connect things like to the internet and connect to things like the MPLS service provider and so on and so forth so WAN in and of itself is so vast that there are people that literally spend their entire careers focusing on WAN connectivity because when you get into the corporate LAN, the local area network, you're not going to have to spend a ton of time in different areas. You're going to spend, hang on one second, is my phone ringing? Nope, somebody was politely sending me a message. Let me go ahead and clear my notifications. Sorry about that. You've got a lot of different capabilities out there that re revolve around the WAN, right? So you've got uh, internet as it can be a WAN. You have private WAN through like an MPLS service provider or if you are reaching out to like an ITSP, an internet telephony um, service provider to do your phone calls if you're doing SIP and things like that. Then you also have anything that you want to run over the public internet, like for example, site-to-site -site VPN, remote access VPN, if you're doing uh, DM VPN, flex VPN, all these things are stuff that you'll learn later on in your careers and in further on training when you get into like CCMP for Encore and Anarsi. Those are gonna be areas that you're gonna be focusing on. Now, on the flip side of that, so far we've talked about the corporate LAN connectivity types. We've talked about spine leaf. We've talked about WAN, right? So what? Just uh, I'll I'll take a quick poll. Would it be easier for me to do some whiteboarding as I'm going through this and kind of just draw it out as I'm going, versus just high level talk about it? Because I have no problem whiteboarding some of this stuff out and trying to draw like paint a picture for you. Would that be easier for you guys? I'll wait a second for the delay to catch up but because I can totally do that and I'm fine with it matter of fact I'll get it ready to go go to a medium size I'm figuring that you guys are going to probably want me to whiteboard a little bit and I've got no problem okay well as long as you guys are okay with the uh, following all the topic if there's any questions I can dive deeper into, into any area so um we have the small office, home office. You could also refer to this as a small branch office. Okay, does it matter? Okay, cool. As long as you guys are understanding what it is I'm trying to convey, that's the important part because I don't want to leave anybody behind, you know, not understanding what I'm talking about. So if you have a question about something, please ask. So we have the small office, home office. This could be, um, okay, whiteboarding is fine with you. Okay, well, I'll throw some whiteboarding in now. So let's... I only need one person to give me the thumbs up. <laughs> so you've got your core and your uh, your core distribution and your access would be your three tier. And you've got your core and distribution and then your access, this will be your two tier, right? 
and then you would connect these guys together. Let's draw another one out like this. And then you would connect these guys together like this and like that and like so. So you'd have a lot of interconnectivity. Two tier would be connecting straight down like that. So these are things that you would need to um, make sure that you would understand architecturally. So your spine leaf is going to be more like this, where you have your leaf, you have your spine, you have another spine, you have a leaf, and you have your leaf, and then you connect these guys together like so. This is going to be your spine leaf. The spines don't connect to the spines, the leaves don't connect to the leaves. Oh, I, I forgot, I'm like right in the way here. So that's basically how these would come together. Now, if I was to clear the screen and talk about this in the terms of the WAN, you have a couple of different options here. You've got you've got your HQ location, right? You've got your HQ, and then you have some sort of internet connectivity. We're using internet connectivity for commodity-based internet for just reachability purposes. And then we have things like MPLS, right? So we have these guys connected, and let's say, for example, we have R1 and we have R2, that connects back into the HQ network, and then R1 and R2 are connected to each other, and then R1 and R2 are connected to the internet, R1 and R2 are both connected to MPLS, and then you're gonna have your branch office over here, you're gonna have a branch office over here, maybe you have a, uh, a second DC over here, and then these guys all connect into the network like so, right? And so you start building out the topology and the infrastructure so that you have reachability everywhere. Is it capable capable that could mess it, mess could mess in three oh met uh, mesh three tier with spine leaf? Um yes you can and that's actually a really good question. So what they refer to that typically and when you're talking a three tier with spine and leaf you're talking a, you have your spine, you have your spine, you have your leaf, a leaf, and a leaf, and you connect these guys all together. They can do this, and actually, the, um, I'm actually glad you asked that, because when you're talking a large data center, maybe this is DC1, right? And then you have DC2 sitting over here, and maybe this is on the same location, maybe this is a geographically different maybe it's you know you got uh, a campus with multiple buildings and each data each camp each building has its own data center and let's say we have a, a spine and a leaf and a spine or and another leaf over here well what you could do to bring this back to a another level architecture you could have a super spine deployed where your spines connect together like this Right, and then you have your connectivity going along like so. So yes, you could you could mesh your three tier with spine and leaf. That is possible to do. The but I will caution you on this type of stuff in saying that when you're meshing the super spine methodology, if you've ever heard of VXLAN, and I have not released the video yet for this, but it has been recorded. There is the concept of a multi-fabric, multi-pod, and then you have multi-site. Depending on how you're trying to deploy your VXLAN solution, the reason I go with VXLAN is because a lot of your solutions nowadays like SDA and uh, Software Defined Access with DNA Center or uh, ACI, they leverage VXLAN for communication, so does NSX for vSphere. And what you would end up having is you would have connections to everybody else, right? Actually, let me, let me change my color over to, to yellow green. You'd have all these connections going to everybody else, right? So depending on the scale, right, you'd have all these connections to everybody else. And as you can see, this becomes kind of a, a nightmare to try to scale, right? As you can see, where there's a better way of doing it. Super spine would be good in an event where you have say through multiple data centers existing in the same location and you want to have a higher level uh, architecture where you have another level above your spines to do connectivity to say the internet or something like that you could pull that off 
but typically speaking you're not going to do that although it is a supported architecture if you wanted to do that just be aware that you can run into problems as you're going forward so typically speaking you wouldn't do that what you would do especially specifically in a design where let me go switch over to my let me erase this out real quick um, what you would do instead in an environment like this is you would use one second here while I clean this up let me switch back over to white what you would do instead is in the VX land solution specifically they have what they call a border gateway and you have a border gateway over here and you connect your spines to the border gateways and then the border gateways connect to each other and what ends up happening then is you will be able to take all of your VXLAN and layer 2 VPN connectivity and basically what you're going to do is you're going to connect your leafs and your spine or your border gateways they'll all form VXLAN tunnels to your border gateways the border gateways will form VXLAN tunnels there and then these guys will form connections this way and by doing it this way if a if MAC address A is learned here and is on the same subnet as something over here and you've got MAC address B B will be learned over here and A will be learned over here but this is a more this is actually a rather advanced deployment method so just be aware that this is like probably the the most I wouldn't say the most advanced but it's a more advanced solution and deployment it took me a while to understand this and then go through all of the deployment methodologies to go through it it was kind of a pain but yes I, I know it's a long-winded answer for your question but you can do it and there's a couple of things you have to be aware of when you're doing that but good question I like that keep that type of stuff coming guys I really enjoy those type of questions so we have that and then let me go back over here real briefly to the small office home office and the on-premises and the cloud because this is where I'm going to tie it all back together so you have a you have your HQ location you have your R1 and you have R2 and they're tied together like this and then you have internet and you have MPLS and then you have your branch office branch office and then you have your uh, DC1 for example and then you connect these guys to this like so no worries Panos so we have that now let's say this is an on-prem or a private cloud these are definitely options that are out there so when I'm when we talk about on-prem meaning that the data center physically is attached to our network so that doesn't physically doesn't have to mean that it's sitting over here you could have the DC sitting at the HQ location right and you know you could have some sort of land cloud that connects into it so you have multiple connections to it but the bottom line is when we're talking about how on-prem comes into play it's something that is you own in a building that you're maintaining that's the first one now you could also have cloud let's say we have I'm just gonna put AWS here in the middle case it's probably the most well-known Azure is pretty close to it as well but obviously not the same thing so you'd have internet and MPLS connections into your AWS infrastructure as well and there's a, multiple ways of pulling that off so this would be where you put your cloud right if the cloud is going to be connected through internet and MPLS maybe you only do maybe you only have and the, the question I get a lot is well how common is MPLS is MPLS everywhere and the answer is no not every customer every client you're going to go work with is going to run MPLS is that a bad thing well not necessarily but the cool thing about it is is when you are dealing with MPLS is there is a um, you do get more capabilities through MPLS than you would if you were going over the internet like you get to maintain your quality of service your service level agreements and that type of stuff are maintained end to end throughout the MPLS backbone because you can uh, that's one of the key things that makes MPLS different than just commodity internet internet doesn't care about your QoS markings so 
stuff like that does come into play. And when you understand it, you're that much better off with it. So just be aware that you can run an entire network op, uh, network on internet, or you can do it over MPLS. It's up to you and how you want to do it. Is it really popular in SP as far as I am? Oh, it's really popular. Yes, uh, yeah, it is. It's very popular. Um, that's one of the big things in the SP world when I was studying for the SP track, that QoS was huge, and so was multicast. Multicast is huge in the SP network. So yes, you are 100% right about that. All right, so keep the questions coming if you have them. I'm gonna keep right on going. We have a couple of things in terms of connectivity. We have different types of cabling technologies. We have connections, shared media, and point-to-point -point for ethernet, and then PoE. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because this is more stuff that you guys can do some research on your own, but uh, just be aware of the different types of PoE. There's PoE, PoE+, plus, UPoE. You know, 15 watts, 30 watts, 60 something watts, so on and so forth. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on cabling because none of you guys are here to be layer one technicians. Nobody wants to do that as a full time job um, that's studying for CCNA. You're, you're aware of it, but it's not your main focus. And I don't think anybody would disagree with me on that. And some IP addressing. So I'm not going to spend any time diving into IP addressing, but. I usually get hung up with people on architecture and stuff like that. So something that I definitely want to lay out. I'm not going to dive very much into Wi-Fi, but if you guys have questions about Wi-Fi, let me know. I'll try to answer them. I'm not a Wi-Fi expert. I know a little bit about a little bit, but I'm going to spend the majority of my time in the network access, IP connectivity, services, and security. That's where I have the most amount of experience. So. Let me talk briefly about the switching concepts in terms of how that stuff works and we'll go from there and then we'll talk a little bit more and we're going to start getting into the, the actual meat and taters because I have a topology for you guys to, to work through and I'm going to start setting stuff up and getting stuff configured here in the next few minutes. So when we talk about Mac learning and aging, by default the switch doesn't have any MAC address is learned, right? It's everything here is dynamically learned through a protocol you guys should have heard about by now, which is ARP, the address resolution protocol. So as endpoints try to communicate with each other, right? If I have PC1 and I have a switch that he connects to and he's on one port and I have PC2 over here and they connect to each other, and they're in the 10.1.1.0 slash 24 network, and I've got the MAC address of one and a MAC address of two, eventually they're gonna have to figure out each other. So if I wanna send a ping to this IP address, I'm sorry, if I wanna send a ping to this IP address, then I'm gonna send the ping, but the switch doesn't know where the MAC address sits, right? So he's gonna send an ARP message out because the PC doesn't know the MAC address. Right, and you need to know both the IP and the MAC in order for layer two and layer three networking to work effectively. I get that question a lot in terms of why do I need both? Um, so just be aware, uh, video stopped for you? Oh, hopefully it's fixed now. You might have to refresh, Marco. But you, you send an ARP request out, you get the, 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 the ARP request is sent out all 255s and you end up getting uh, the devices, every device will get it in the VLAN, but when they start to decapsulate it and they realize that the destination IP address isn't theirs, they just discard it. When the device that does own that, okay, cool. So when the device that does own that MAC address or that IP address receives it, he's going to send an ARP reply back with his MAC address, and that's how you learn about MAC address 1 here and MAC address 2 here, and that's how they're able to figure that stuff out. And that's how Mac learning works. Now Mac aging, by default, the Mac, yeah, that's a, I can start, I can build in. The Mac address table aging timer is 300 seconds, five minutes, right? Five minutes that Mac address is gonna stay learned and you'll be able to, as long as there's active traffic coming from that device, the Mac address will be learned. Okay, makes sense, but can I adjust this? You can, 
do I recommend you do? It depends on the environment. If the environment is super secure, I've actually dropped this down to the minimums and I don't remember what that is off the top of my head, but 300 seconds can be dropped down to 30 seconds. Um, I'm, it depends on the device. Now we have, when it comes to frame switching, there's a couple of different types of frame switching. You have uh, store and forward, you, and you have cut through. There's a couple of other ones out there, but these are the two that are most common. Store and forward means that you're going to receive the entire data flow from a device. You're going to take the, fur, uh, take the entire layer two header and you're gonna run a check on to make sure that it's good to go. And then as long as it's good to go, and you've run all your checks to make sure that the frame isn't bad, you're going to immediately start forwarding it at that point. So, but this one takes longer, but it's got a higher degree of error checking. And so therefore your, any errors in the network should drop when you do this. Cut through switching is different. Cut through switching is you're gonna take the data in, you're gonna take the first 64 bytes of the traffic and you're immediately gonna start sending it. Here it's cut through. It's not waiting on this. Ha this this one here has a lower error percentage. This one has a higher error percentage. But when we're talking about networks today, it's it's kind of a wash. Now back in the day, you know, mid to early two thousands, you know, even in the the mid two thousand tens, this was more common. But now that switching has become, you know, ten and twenty five and hundred gigabit, it's Pretty uncommon for that to be a major issue nowadays. Frame flooding. Uh, we actually just talked about that with um, with ARP because if you have other switches that are connected down here, they're gonna learn one and two on that guy. And then if you have another switch over here, you're gonna learn one and two on that port, so on and so forth. So as the network grows, the MAC addresses will continue to be learned as you progress. The MAC address table. There's going to be a MAC address table per VLAN that's going to be created, and this is how separation of traffic is done, right? And that's one of the things that I see a lot of people struggle with, especially when they start dealing with segmentation. People need to understand that the moment you create a VLAN, a VLAN equals a MAC address table and a spanning tree protocol instance. And this is super important because when you're looking at this, when you're dealing with endpoints, so PC1 and PC2 are in this VLAN, PC1 is going to have MAC1, PC2 is going to have MAC2. This, these MAC addresses are going to get learned by the MAC address table, right? And then the spanning tree protocol for that particular VLAN is going to run spanning tree to make sure that there's no loops on a per VLAN basis. So... If you've got 100 VLANs, you're going to have 100 spanning tree protocol instances. Now, in a large scale environment, you're going to want to make sure that your layer two environment is as small as possible. Route as soon as you can. Bridge where you must, route where you can, is the methodology. And the idea with that is, if you're in a really large environment and you're doing lots and lots of MAC address propagation, that could be problematic. So keep those things in mind when we're talking about how things tie in together because I see a lot I've seen some environments in my pat in the past that were like wow why are they doing it this way or you try to argue with them well no, I shouldn't say argue you try to explain why what they're doing doesn't make any sense anymore and they should migrate sometimes they're good about it sometimes they're not so keep those things in mind when you're talking about spanning tree and VLANs and MAC addresses and things like that because at the end of the day, it's basic layer two connectivity that you're trying to imp implement. And that stuff is important for all your other higher level layers to work. Layer three won't work if layer two is not squared away. And that's really important to understand. We'll talk about that here in just a couple of minutes when we get into the config. So with that being said, the next thing I'm gonna go ahead and talk about is the difference between data and voice. And then we're gonna talk about the default VLAN and then connectivity and then we'll uh, briefly touch on the pri on the native VLAN because it's something that I see a lot of people struggle with. So we'll basically cover that in as much detail as we need to. 
Now, data is going to be the switch port access command. The voice will be the switch port voice VLAN command. Now, the difference between these two, I get a common question I get is, do I need to configure a trunk from my switch port that connects down to my my PC and to my my phone as a trunk link? No, you do not, and you shouldn't do that, because that implies VLAN tagging, and we're not trying to tag our VLANs. We're not trying to connect to another switch. We're not trying to maintain the MAC address table between two switches. We are trying to get access to two different networks. When traffic is received in on your switch port access command, meaning it's going to be the data VLAN, the PC or the server is not going to tag their traffic. They don't tag their traffic, so therefore there's no reason for you to worry about trying to match on a tag. As soon as traffic, and I'll draw this out real quick, the idea here is this. If I have PC1 sitting here, and he's connected to this port right there, and if I have a switch going up here and another connection up here like this, if this guy's MAC address is 1, MAC address 1 is going to get learned, and let's say this is gig 0 slash 0. You're going to get MAC address 1, it'll be learned on gig 0 slash 0, and that information will be propagated up the trunk link over to here, and this guy will learn it, and he'll learn, let's say this is gig 0 slash 3. You'll learn MAC address 1 on gig 0 slash 3. Now, because that's how the, the propagation works, the tagging only exists right here. That's all that that's all that tagging exists on is the trunk link connectivity between the switches. As soon as the traffic is received by the other switch, it's going to remove the 802.1q header. So the 802.1q header is removed, and all you have is a layer two information: source and destination MAC address, all that type of stuff. The voice VLAN is a little bit different because the phone is going to automatically tag its traffic with certain QoS markings. Specifically, in the class of service, you're going to mark it with a value of 5, which in the type of service is going to be expedited forwarding. Meaning, I am voice traffic, I am latency sensitive, I need to have as much throughput to get from point A to point B as I can. So, the voice VLAN the traffic is going to get marked with uh, voice over IP, or I'm sorry, uh, QoS marking, and there's going to be some other stuff that goes into play. If you want to know more about how to differentiate the voice VLAN, look up the internal VLAN. Go to a little, do a little bit of research on that. Google that. You'll find what I'm talking about. I'm not going to go into a ton of de uh, detail here on that because this is not a voice course. The default VLAN, VLAN one. Right, everybody's favorite VLAN. I've walked into more environments than I can shake a stick at, and VLAN one is the VLAN that's deployed. And I'm like, like really, guys? Um, why, why you do me like that? But it is the case. The native VLAN. The native VLAN by default is also VLAN one. What does native mean? Native means what? Native, mean, native means untagged. Can I change the native VLAN? Yes, you can. And where, you, where do you do that? On the trunk link. You would define whatever tagging you want. So if the native VLAN you want on a per trunk basis is going to be VLAN 100, guess what? VLAN 100, as it crosses the switch connectivity, won't be tagged. Simple as that. There's really nothing more to it than that. Do I recommend changing your native VLAN? That's up to you. I've gotten into discussions about it before. Uh, I honestly have no hardcore opinion on it. Do what you want. If you want to change your native VLAN, go right ahead. If you do want to keep it the same, by all means, go ahead. But if you change it, make sure that it matches on both ends. Just be aware of those type of things. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and I am going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to move into some, some config. We're going to dive into how we're going to get the, the configuration in place. We're going to walk through some of the configuration options that are here. We're going to get some basic layer 2 networking going. 
If anybody has any questions, feel free to let me know, but I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to my Eve topology. So we're gonna spend the majority of our time here, and my goal is to get this entire topology, uh, layer two networking in play, HSRP, all that type of stuff is gonna come into play here. And this is basically what we're gonna be spending the majority of our time on. We're gonna dive into routing, we're gonna dive into getting connectivity out to the internet and stuff like that. So as we progress forward, this is where the rubber's really gonna meet the road and what I want you guys to be good at, right? This is, um, there was a comment made earlier that uh, I earned my CCNA back in April, but still feel like a fraud. Well, guess what? You wanna not feel like a fraud? This is the type of stuff that you need to be able to do um, day in and day out. This should be the area that you spend the majority of your time in, is being good in this stuff. And that will make you feel less like a fraud and more like a engineer. Because you pass your CCNA, right? We wanna, you wanna feel good about the, the the pass, right? The the win of passing the CCNA. I remember when I passed mine. It was my son's birthday in 2013. I passed CCNA, and I was over the moon happy, right? Because it took a long time. It took me three attempts before I passed it. So, don't feel bad if you took it more than once. So, as we're progressing forward, we're gonna get go through a bunch of different configuration options and things like that. Um, I did post a, um, let's see here. I did post a link to a Google Drive link that you guys will have access to. So if you want to dive into that, you can and pull it down and we will go through and work through it. Uh, there's also a packet tracer file. The packet tracer file is right here. Um, if you don't have EVNG, you can certainly use Packet Tracer. I might use this for doing a little bit of wireless stuff because I can't do that in Eve, but for the most part, we're gonna be doing everything in Packet Tracer. Or everything in Eve, that's what I meant to say. So I'm also gonna set up a couple of packet captures down the road. We're gonna get into some dynamic routing, some static routing, a little bit of NAT, and all that good stuff that goes along with it. And we'll take it a little bit beyond what you guys need to know in terms of routing, but the goal is to walk you through the config, what's going on where, how it operates, that type of stuff, and go from there. If you guys have any questions at any point in time, continue to, to keep asking, and I will do my best to try to answer them. So the first thing that we're gonna have to do is we have a couple of different VLANs, right? We wanna set up the networking so that we have the capability of switch six and switch seven are gonna be basically our core switches or our, I should say our collapsed core, because I don't have a, another tier of switches above it. And then we have switch eight, which is gonna be our access layer switch, and all of our PCs connect to it. Eventually our goal will be to set up inter VLAN routing. So VLAN 10 can talk to VLAN 20. And then we're also going to set up connectivity to R1. I did not label these yet ahead of time, but we will take a look at that. Do will the configurations in Eve work in Packet Tracer? They will. Um, just about everything that we're going to be talking about in Eve should work in Packet Tracer. Uh, there might be a few commands that might not be available, but uh, I'd say 90 plus percent of what we're doing will be supported in Eve. So actually, before I get into that, let me talk briefly about how you can make this work. If you have a decent sized PC, let's say you've got uh, what am I running on this guy? I am running a Pull up device manager real quick. I am running on my personal computer. I am running, where's my CPUs? I'm running an eight core i7-9700K, right? So it's, it's pretty beefy. So if you were to download EVNG, the community version, which is what this guy is, run this in the community version and dedicate for, and download the, uh, the, the OVA, if you were to go out and grab, it is VMware Workstation Player. So I'm gonna go ahead and just pull that up real quick. And I will put the link in the description. So VMware Workstation Player Download.
If you were to grab this right here, it is not a paid product. It is a free product that you can use. And essentially what you would do with it, I'll go ahead and just talk about this briefly. Downward, uh, Workstation 16 player for Windows, you download it. It is a free to run unless you are gonna be uh, running Workstation Pro for doing additional things. Workstation player will allow you to run one VM and one VM only and you'll be able to install EVNG into your workstation player and then you'll be able to import that Eve topology that I've got working right now. So this is free. Everything I'm showing you to right now to run is free. The only thing you might uh the only thing you'll have to spring for would be the um would be the Cisco modeling labs or the CML images. Uh, you pay the 200 bucks to for that, and that would be, let me go do a quick search for that as well. Uh, Cisco Modeling Labs Personal. Let me click on this guy real quick. This would be the other thing you'd want to get, is this guy, CML. So CML, you pay the 200 bucks, and then you get access to all of these images. And I'm using these images right here in my lab. So you'll be able to download them and be able to run them inside of your Eve server and be good to go. Um, right now, I'm currently using the default settings. So I'm using four CPUs and eight gigs of RAM. And if I was to, let me go ahead and uh, I'll share these in the, the chat so you guys will have access to them. The zip file has a PKT file, which, correct. Um, there is a, there's no zip files. The zip file that's in that Google Drive that I shared with you is the E file, not the packet tracer. So I'm running currently on the default setup and I'm using 60% CPU and 20% RAM. So your PC will start to crawl a little bit when you start running this, but at least you'll have the ability of running real iOS, which is always gonna be a game changer. All right, so we're gonna, my goal here, let me go ahead and pull up and do a, uh, a text, let me, uh, let me go ahead and add a text box here. So my workflow is gonna be we're gonna set up uh, VLANs, trunks, VTP, server, client. We're gonna set up STP or rapid STP. We're gonna set up um, HSRP. We're gonna set up uh, layer three switching. HSRP, and that should wrap up over the next hour. Hopefully we'll get that done before three o'clock. But that's basically what it is that I'm gonna be walking you guys through as we move forward. So I'm gonna have this laid out here so you guys will see. Let me go ahead and just edit this real quick and align that. Save, we'll bring this to the front. and I'll put him up here in the upper left. So we, we know the flow that we're gonna go through. I will save these for later, working on building a workstation PC. Awesome, good stuff, cool beans. All right, so the first thing we're gonna go through and do in um, to right now is we're gonna configure switch six and switch seven for some VLANs. We're gonna go ahead and Actually, before I do that, I'm gonna configure switch A just to give you guys an idea of how some of this stuff works. Um, I'll do a basic config. I'm gonna to go to global config and create VLAN uh, 10. I'm gonna name it VLAN 10. And then I'm gonna put uh, gig, zero, gig one slash zero and gig one slash one. I'll put them into 
VLAN 10, so interface range, gig 1 slash 0 through 1, and I'll say switch port access VLAN 10. Switch port mode of switch port mode of access and then spanning tree port fast. So it immediately transitions into forwarding. And then what I'll do is on a PC 11 and 12, I'm going to say IP is going to be 10.1.10.11 slash 24. And PC 12, I'm going to type in IP will be 10.1.10.12 slash 24. Just like that. Now if I go back over here to switch 6 and I'm sorry, switch 8 and I do a show VLAN brief, I can see that those two ports are now inside of VLAN 10. If I do a show MAC address table dynamic, I don't see anything showing up inside of VLAN 10 yet. But if I was to go to PC 11 and ping 10.1.10.12, I can get the ping right away. And if I go back over here to switch 8 and hit the up arrow, I'm going to see both MAC addresses showing up inside of my MAC address table for that specific VLAN. So that's basically, that's as simple as it gets in terms of networking. Like the, you should be able to do this with your, your eyes closed. Create a VLAN, apply it to some ports, put a couple PCs into, give them some IP addresses and voila, right? Now we're gonna take this a step further and I'm going to configure switch six and switch seven with VLAN 10 and VLAN, uh, 20 and then we're going to configure the trunks. Oh, I forgot to mention I'm going to go ahead and uh, trunk VTP I will do rapid STP and then I'll do um, I will do an LACP port channel Like I said, I hope to get everything done in the next hour. I don't think we're gonna have a problem with that though. And I'm not in any real big hurry either. If you guys have questions on stuff, we can definitely answer them. So let's go to switch six and I'm gonna go to global config. I'm gonna do show VLAN brief. And obviously we don't have VLAN 10 created. So I'm gonna create VLAN 10. I'm gonna give it a name of VLAN 10. And I'm gonna say VLAN 20. That short little pause, you guys, when you guys see it, is the VLAN being created. And I'll put in here VLAN 20, and now that's good to go. So I have the VLAN created. The next thing I have to go do, and I'm going to create that on just one VLAN, on one switch, because when you have VTP in your environment, or you're going to be leveraging VTP in your environment, you should only be making your VLAN modifications to one switch, because if you have them configured on both. At some point in the future, there will be a problem where traffic will get the VLANs you have created in one switch won't line up with the other one, and then you'll get a VTP update. So it's, it makes more sense to have VTP working on just one switch and then propagating your updates to another all the other ones versus you having two different switches that you have to update. So I've got the, v, the VLANs created here, and if I do show CDP neighbor, I should see switch seven and switch eight. I have two connections to switch eight and I have one connection to switch seven. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the interface range command and I'm gonna configure all of my interfaces here on switch six and seven to be trunk links. So I'm gonna type in interface, interface range, gig zero slash zero through two. And I'm gonna type in switch port trunk encapsulation dot one Q and then switch port mode of trunk. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and say, do show history and I'm going to take these same config commands and I'm going to dump them onto switch seven. I'm just going to go ahead and paste them in real quick. Awesome. Now, because I've done that, I've basically sped the process up of getting the trunking configuration in play. If I was to look at switch eight now, I didn't configure any trunking on switch eight at all. I just created the VLAN, applied it to the ports, and now I have the IP or the MAC addresses showing up in my MAC or in my VLANs. 
if I do a, or in my back address table, excuse me. So if I come in and do a show interface trunk, guess what I see? I see gig zero, zero, one, two, and three. They're in the mode of auto, which means that they are gonna be automatically negotiated using DTP or dynamic trunking protocol. And I see n-802.1q, which means that the northbound switch, or in this case here, switch six and switch seven, are configuring all their ports as trunk links using the 802.1q encapsulation method. And that information is being pushed down to these switches, or switch eight. And this would work for if I had more switches associated here, but I only have one for simplicity. So that information is being pushed down to switch eight. Switch eight learns that, and now I have a bunch of trunk links. The next thing for me to go do would be to set up VTP. So I'm gonna to go to, and the reason why that would be important is because I wanna propagate VLAN 20 down so I can get PC 13 and PC 14 online. So I'm gonna go over to switch six. I'm gonna exit out of the range command. I'm gonna type in VTP domain, and I'll just call this CCNA, something very simple. Right now, the VTP domain has been changed to CCNA. And if I look at switch seven now, Remember, I didn't configure anything on switch seven other than the trunk links. I didn't configure any VLANs at all. And if I do show VLAN brief, guess what I have? I have the VLANs are brought over. The reason the, re the, reason the VLANs were brought over was as soon as I create a VTP domain, that information is broadcasted out all the trunk links to all the other switches. And by doing that, VLAN switch seven and switch eight will both learn any VLAN information they didn't already have. So if I was to do a do show VTP status, you're gonna see that my VTP domain is going to be CCNA. And you can see that the number of existing VLANs is seven, the configuration revision is two, which means there's been two changes. I've added two VLANs, VLAN 10 and VLAN 20. If I go to switch eight, it'll be the same thing. If I hit the up arrow on this one right here, I should see 10 and 20. Now, if we do a show VLAN brief, I have VLAN 10 and 20 now, which is what I wanna see. If I show VTP status, I can see the same information, right? CCNA is the domain name. Now, because switch eight, are all the switches running as VTP servers? Yes, they are all, and I was just about to get to that. Great question. They are all running in the mode of server, right? So what I wanna do is obviously change that because I don't want to have all of my access layer switches running in the mode of server if I'm actively using VTP, right? So on switch eight, I'm gonna go here type in VTP mode is going to be client. Right or in the newer versions of iOS, you can actually turn VTP off completely. Um, your mileage may vary, and uh, use at your own risk. So basically, if you're okay with manually configuring VLANs, that would be the ideal way to go. Most customers that I've worked with in production, they turn VTP off. So keep those type of things in mind. Now. With VTP mode client turned on, if I wanted to create VLAN 21, it's gonna say VTP VLAN configuration not allowed when device is in client mode. In other words, I can't create VLANs, right? I, if I wanted to create another VLAN, I'd have to go up to switch six or switch seven and configure it as such, right? And that can be problematic. Now, what I'm gonna do is on switch six, seven, and eight, I'm going to configure a VTP version three. So most of you guys haven't seen this, or if you have, it's a refresher. So VTP question mark version, and I'm gonna put in three. That's gonna take a couple seconds. And it says old, uh, old version two VLAN configuration file detected and read okay version three files will be written in the future. Awesome, thanks for the heads up. And I'm gonna do this to all of my switches. Drop that in like that, and then drop this in like that. All right, now if I 
do show v, uh, VTP status, you're gonna see now a little bit of a different look and feel, right? I can see that I'm running version three. My domain is CCNA still. I'm in the operational mode of client. And you can see the number of existing VLANs, extended VLANs, excuse me, which is gonna be VLANs 1005 through, or uh, do show VLAN brief, uh, 1006 through 4094. I don't have any extended VLANs. Extended VLANs are anything in the 1000 or higher range. Anything normal range VLANs is gonna be one through 1001. So I can't really do anything configuration wise here. So if I wanted to make a change anywhere in my environment, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go and configure one of my switches to be the VTP server, right? I'm going to come up and type in VTP primary for VLANs and I'm going to hit the enter key and it says this system is becoming primary server for future VLAN. What that means is only switch 6 will be allowed to create VLANs. Switch 7 will not be able to do that. Switch 8 will not be able to do that. It says no conflicting VTP3 devices found. So what it did is it queried switch seven and switch eight and said, hey guys, are either one of you primary for creating VLANs for the feature of VLAN? And we can see that if we look back over here in switch eight, if I scroll up here, you notice that the feature you know, VTP operating modes and transparent mode for both of these guys, but nothing's going on, right? There's no, this guy right here, isn't showing like the, my primary ID is showing up as zeros. Now if I hit the up arrow, sometimes this changes, sometimes it does not. I might have to trigger an update, but switch six is uh, actually, sorry, confirm it and then hit the up arrow again. Okay, and now notice how it now it changes and it says the primary ID is gonna be this MAC address. So it knows who the primary guy is and this will change and then you'll see that any of the updates that need to come through, only Switch 6 will be allowed to create VLANs in the environment. So it's a much tighter way of doing the configuration. Keep these things in mind when you're looking at how to roll it out. So some cool stuff to enhance your environment. If you need to run Spanish or VTP, this is basically how you would go about doing that. Now, if we were to look at the show spanning tree, what are we already in? We're already in a rapid spanning tree protocol. Rap, a rapid PBST is a, or, I'm sorry, before I go any further, anybody have any questions about what we've covered so far? I've covered VLANs, trunking, and VTP. Any questions so far before I move on? I just wanna, you know, just keep on trucking. If not, that's fine but I just wanna make sure I don't leave anybody, I don't think there is, but hey, you know what? You never know. All right. So I don't think there's any questions, but if you have them, go ahead and drop them into the, the chat and I will go ahead and uh, answer them if you have them. I don't think there's any questions, but you never know. So, why RSTP and not PBST? Great question. So, time, that's the number one reason. So, rapid PBST, you are looking at between two and four seconds for convergence versus 30 to 50 seconds with convergence depending on the environment. So, when Rapid PBST doesn't rely strictly on timers like PBST does. It relies on a what they call a proposal and acknowledgement methodology. And basically the way that that works is you have uh, you have switch six and switch seven are technically upstream or core distribution devices of switch eight. No no problems there, right? 
So if something happens in the environment with regular PBST, I am going to have to wait. I'm going to put ports into blocking mode. And then once the 20 second max age timer, which is basically blocking mode, kicks into play, I'm going to then wait in the forwarding delay for both listening and learning. So it's 50 seconds. It's almost a solid minute of waiting around, right? And that in a normal environment in today's networks, that's like unheard of. Like you don't run regular spanning tree in any environment today in a regular PBST because it's just too slow. People are looking for reconvergence to be much, much faster. So you run PB, RP, uh, RSTP. RSTP is going to say, okay, this is what I've got going on here. I've got a couple of ports and he's going to become the root bridge. He'll send that information down to switch eight. Switch, switch eight will go through a process of blocking ports to make sure that, to try to figure out how the topology is laid out. And this is all done by BPDU. If I was to look up the Cisco rapid Spanning tree protocol. Let me see if I can't find this doc here. This is kind of a difficult topic to explain, but essentially I will redirect you to this URL. I'll throw this in the chat real quick. You can go ahead and read up on regular spanning or, uh, or rapid PBST, but essentially you're trying to not rely on timers to for reconvergence. You're trying to act like a routing protocol where one switch is trying to communicate with another switch saying, hey, this is what I've got going on. The other switch is saying, oh, okay, no problem. Let me go ahead and do my thing and we'll go ahead and make sure that we're loop free but it happens like in a couple of seconds versus waiting a minute for traffic to circle and stuff like that. So um, to be honest with you, it's not the most straightforward topic to understand, but and it's been a long time since I've read into it. So I don't remember the specifics, but the main reason for it is speed is number one, obviously with the term rapid. Now, if you are diving into something like multiple spanning tree protocol or MSTP, it works along the same lines, right? We end up having connectivity to a couple of different devices and we want to make sure that the topology is loop free, but we don't want to have, well, we have lots of VLANs. Well, the problem with regular spanning tree protocol is that for every VLAN that you create, you create another STP instance and then you end up having to send BPDUs on your switches to any of the other switches out the trunk links. Now this isn't a bad thing in most cases if, it's, if you've got a, a small number of VLANs, it's only a, you know 10 or 15 BPDUs. But if you have a couple hundred VLANs, you're gonna be sending a couple hundred BPDUs out each link. Multiple spanning tree protocol sends one. And it's a it's a basically a bulk push. You're sending one BPDU, but you're sending a list of VLANs in that update saying, hey, this is all the VLANs that I have. I don't believe that's on the blueprint. Yeah, it's just a rapid PBST. So we're gonna go and configure primary and secondary and then uh, the port states forwarding and blocking and that's pretty much it. We're not going to go into much more detail than that but if you want to read up on what I, what I would recommend you do is read up on the basics to how both regular PBST works and how rapid works and just understand the differences. Right, That's the real big thing because at the end of the day my suspicion or my guess if I had to go on a limb here would be that uh, yeah, exactly. I would say that the majority of what you're going to be tasked with doing is like, can you identify which switch is the root bridge or how would you de define the root bridge? What would you do to actually set it up? 
That type of stuff is what they're going to ask you at the CCNA level. At the CCNP level, they might take it a little bit deeper. But to be honest with you, if you understand some of the basics and you read just on the, the, the beginning parts of the theory, you'll be surprised at how easy this stuff is. Uh, as you can see, it's only it's a handful of commands per technology that we've talked about so far. So it's nothing super involved, as you can already tell. So um, what I'm going to do is on switch 6 and switch 7 is I'm going to configure switch 6 to be the root bridge for VLAN 10 and VLAN switch 7 to be the root bridge for VLAN 20, but then to be the, the backups of each other. So essentially what we'll end up having is this guy will be for VLAN 10. This will be root primary. And then VLAN 20, this will be root secondary. And same thing with here, VLAN 10, this will be root secondary. And for VLAN 20, this will be root primary. That's what we're gonna go configure right now and get them squared away. So let's go ahead and knock that out real quick. I'm gonna go to uh, VLAN, or sorry, spanning tree, VLAN 10, is gonna be root primary, and VLAN 20 is gonna be root secondary. That, and it's that simple. There's really nothing more to it than that. And do the same thing on switch seven. We're gonna type in VLAN spanning tree VLAN 10 root or uh, root secondary and VLAN 20 root primary. Just like that, pretty simple stuff. And we're in good shape. So with that being said, we're good to go. That's that's spanning tree. Now, is there a lot of other details that you can go through? Sure, there's a lot of, let me go ahead and back up my mic just a little bit. There are a lot of other things that you could dive into and do a show spanning tree and um, all the details for this. So just at a high level for VLAN 10 on switch seven, so we're looking at switch seven for VLAN 10, we can see that the rapid PBST is turned on and you would use the command spanning tree mode rapid PBST to configure this. It's on, on by default, which is the, what should be there. You have the, the, root, the local information is right here, right? So this is my local, or I'm sorry, yes. I'm sorry, though this is the root, this is the root information. So it's the root ID and it's saying the cost is four and it's telling you in order to reach the root bridge, the root port is out gig zero slash two, which is this interface right here, which points to switch six. And if I was to look at my my local, I had the, the address of seven and I have a priority of 28672. So this priority right here and this priority right here, basically what they mean is you deducted 4096 off of the 32768 that you started with. So if I am a secondary, try to, so if I am, if I'm the, uh, sorry, if I'm primary, if I'm primary, I'm gonna take 32768 and I'm gonna subtract 8192. If I am secondary, I'm going to take 32768 and I'm going to deduct 4096 from it. By doing this, I'm able to very easily configure my devices accordingly, right? So it's just a simple it's it's just a macro, right? Nothing nothing fancy. But the cool thing is is it gives me a specific detail. I don't have to set configure the priority. You use uh, root secondary, root primary, everybody's happy, right? It gets the job done. And that's really all there is to it in terms of the operations. So that's pretty much how that comes into play. Now, is there any question? Okay. 
So doing this overrides the blocked ports and utilizes both redundant connections as traffic flow for their VLAN. That is the idea, yes. So when you have the deployment set up the way that we're doing it, when you're trying to drive traffic a certain direction with spanning tree, this is how you would do that. You would start to open up ports and it's logical blocking based off of the VLAN itself. So if I was to come down here, um, I'm going to get, since this is a root bridge, I'm going to get a lot of designated and a lot of, on a, and a lot of root port. My root port is going to point me towards the root bridge for specific VLANs, in this case here, VLAN 1. If I was to look at switch 8, though, and do a show spanning tree, you're going to see a little bit of a different output. On here, for my connections, I'm going to see gig 0 slash 0, right, is going to be root port for, and this is VLAN, sorry, let me go look at VLAN 10. If I look at this, I'm going to see gig 0 slash 0 as my root port to reach switch 6, which connects me to root switch 6. But you'll notice that gig 1, 2, and 3 are all blocking, right? These are all blocking. So the other connection, my secondary connection to switch 6, and my secondary, my two connections to switch 7, they're all blocked, which is what Spanish tree is going to do. It's going to block the ports. So because it's going to block the ports, we have to take that into consideration. Now, if I do the same thing for VLAN 20, it's going to be a very similar look and feel. The only difference between the two is that gig 2 is my lowest port ID connecting to switch 7. So it is the root bridge for VLAN 20. Gig 00, gig 01 are, blo are blocked, and gig 03 are blocked. But um, because the, they're, uh, gig 00 and gig 01 are blocked because switch 6 is not my root bridge for switch or VLAN 20, but switch 7 is. So I can only have one root port even though I have multiple connections. Now, I'm not a big fan of this. So typically speaking, what I like to do is I like to convert this over to a port channel. So that's the next thing we're going to do. We're going to set up LACP port channels between switch 7 and switch uh, 8 and switch 6 and switch 8. This is going to allow me to take and give myself more flexibility. I'm still going to have blocked ports, but I'm not going to be blocking on a single port. I'm going to be actually allowing traffic to that's going towards the root bridge to use gig 02 and gig 03 because they're going to be member ports of the port channel. So what I'm going to do is on switch 8, I'm going to go to global config, interface range, gig 0 slash 0 through 3, and I'm going to shut them down. Give that a couple seconds to do its thing, and I'm going to configure port channels. Switch 6 will be the same thing. Interface range, gig 0 slash 0 through 1. Shut them down. I find it's easier to shut them down than just let them run and then negotiate. I find it's easier to shut them down, configure them, and then they'll be able to do their thing. Interface range, gig 0 slash 0 through 1. Shut. So I'm going to go over to switch 6. And in here I'm going to type in the channel protocol is going to be LACP and the channel group I'm going to give it a number and I'll say here I'll do 68 for channel switch uh, switch 6 and switch 8 and I'll say the mode will be active so enable LACP unconditionally and what it's telling me is that range gig 0 slash 0 do show run interface gig 0 slash 0 hmm that's weird I'm not exactly sure what it's telling me it's kind of a weird error I don't think I've ever seen oh 
Let me use a different number then. Let me just use channel group one and mode of active. There we go. So the number was wrong. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and say no shut on this side. And on the switch eight side, I'm gonna go to uh, interface range gig zero slash zero through one. Channel protocol will be LACP, channel group, and I'll say one mode of active. And then I'm gonna go ahead and say no shut. Because I've got the, the configuration set up the way that I do, the port channels will automatically inherit the config of the underlying member interfaces. And so the port channel, there it goes, the port channel. If I go to switch six, same thing. So do show ether channel summary. And both of my ports are in a port channel. Okay, let me go ahead and do the same thing on switch seven. Type in channel protocol is gonna be LACP. Channel group will be mode, channel group one mode of active and no shut switch eight same thing so interface range gig zero slash two through three type so in switch ports or i'm sorry uh, channel protocol lacp channel group two mode active and then i'm going to no shut these guys so this will get the connection online. Let me go ahead and clear the screen off real quick so that I don't have any garbage on there. The port channel should come online here just in a moment. Now, once this is done, and there it goes. Now, if I come back down here and I do a show spanning tree for VLAN 10, you're going to have the port channel one is going to be the root for VLAN 10, but I'm gonna have port channel two will be in blocking mode. And if I do a show ether channel summary, you're gonna see that port channel one has gig zero zero and gig zero one in it. And our, I'm gonna be able to load balance traffic over both links because of how everything is laid out. Port channel two, same thing. And if I hit the up arrow and I look at VLAN 20, I just have flip-flopped my connection to where I'm uh, looking at port channel one. That's weird. Why does it say designated? Oh, um, that's just weird because that's just that's just what is figured out. So we're in good shape. It's blocked to port elsewhere. So that is basically how that would come into play and become operational. So. That is that. Any questions on spanning tree or LACP before we move into setting up layer three switching and HSRP? Well, you guys are, I'm gonna uh, go ahead and configure VLAN 20 on gig one slash two and one slash three on switch eight. So I'm gonna do show VLAN brief and we're gonna do interface range gig one slash two through three. I type a switch port access VLAN 20, switch port mode of access, spanning tree port fast. And then I'm gonna go ahead and get PC 13 and PC 14 IP address, IP of 10.1.20.13 slash 24, and IP of 10.1.20.14 slash 24, just like that. And I'm gonna do a ping to 10.1.20.13. Let's make sure that show VLAN brief, show spanning tree VLAN 20. Okay, so that should be working. Okay. All right, let's try that one more time. There we go. So the ARP table had to be built. Awesome, so we can do a 
show MAC address table dynamic for VLAN 20. All right, so we're good to go. All right, so there's don't know that there's any questions coming in or any topics that anything else that you would want to break down. So I feel like we're in a good spot right now. What I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to transition into layer three switching. So we're going to configure switch six and switch seven to have default or to be the default gateways of our environment and all that good stuff. So let me go ahead and make a quick adjustment to my topology. You guys can do this as well. I'm just going to, to add a little bit of context to what I've got going on here. And I'm going to put in here the IP address that I'm going to be using, which will be uh, 10.1.6.0 slash 24. And that's going to go right there. And then I'm going to copy and paste that, or I should say duplicate it. And I'm going to edit this one. This will be 10.2.7, just like that. Save. All right. So this will be some of the subnetting we're going to put into play. And this will allow us to do things like dynamic routing and some static routing and things like that. So, all right, so it doesn't look like there's any questions, which is awesome. Um, if I'm, uh, must be doing everything right then. <laughs> all righty, good stuff. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and get layer three switching configured on switch six and switch seven. And the way that I'm gonna do that is on switch six. Oh, that's that's cute. Oh, it looks like we have a little bit of a problem here. Show ether channel summary. Huh. That's cute. Oh, you know, I bet you I know why it's giving me these problems because of the fact that. Um, I don't have these guys configured as, they're not hard coded as trunk ports. So show interfaces trunk. That's cute. So let me go, <laughs> that's cute. There's like, there's no configure, it says show run real quick. They should be configured as trunks or set up as trunks anyway. Uh, the port channel. It's like they config. Okay, so I'm gonna have to go configure them as trunk links real quick. Was the ether channel channel groove number thing a bug? Why could you, why couldn't I use 68? Um, I think that is a bug on this particular platform. Um, I've never seen that before. That, that was weird. Uh, interface range gig zero slash zero through three. Type in uh, switch port trunk and cap dot one Q switch port mode of trunk. And that should, that'll bring those guys down. Once they renegotiate, they'll be okay. Just like that. And if we do or show interfaces trunk, there they go. So we're good to go there. All right, so that fixes that. So little things like that can come back to bite you. <laughs> All good. So just make sure your um, make sure your devices are configured appropriately. Uh, just so you guys know, I will be taking the running configurations of the switches and the routers and stuff like that. I will put them into the uh, into the Google Drive link that I shared with you guys. That'll be in the in there so you guys will be able to basically see what I did to configure everything. So you'll have the final configs as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and on switch six and switch seven, I'm gonna go create two SVIs. I'll create 
as an SPI for VLAN 10 and an SPI for VLAN 20. I will configure 6 and 7 as the IP addresses, so 10.1.10.6, 10.1.20.6, .10 so on and so forth. And then we'll be able to set up HSRP. I prefer to use the .254 IP address when I set up HSRP. You can use whatever IP address you want, but I just happen to like .254 because it's the last IP in the range. So I'm going to type in interface VLAN 10. I'm going to say the IP address here will be 10.1.10.6 slash 24. And you can see that if we do show IP interface brief, that the SVIs on a real switch are by default shut down, where in Packet Tracer, it'll be automatically turned on. So just be aware of stuff like that when you're um, playing with it. And we'll make this one here 20.6. So I'm gonna go ahead and no shut this guy. Interface VLAN 10, no shut. And so do show IP interface brief. All right, let me go ahead and configure switch seven to be the same. So interface VLAN 10, IP address here will be 10.1.10.7 slash 24. And no shut. Interface VLAN 20, IP address here of 10.1.20.7 slash 24. And no shut. All right. Now that we have that in play, and we do show IP interface brief, now we can begin our HSRP setup. So I'm gonna start on VLAN 10, interface VLAN 10. I'm gonna type in standby, and then the VLAN in this case here will be VLAN 10. The IP that I'm gonna use is gonna be 10.1.10.254. And I'm gonna go ahead and set the priority on this guy to where, um, you should tie it configuration wise so that whatever your root bridge is for that VLAN, the primary root bridge, that should also be your HSRP default gateway. So you should tie, I'll try to tie them to the same box. So as you can see, when active, I'm going to say the priority is going to be 255 and I'm going to say preemption. So in the event that there's a failure, you can always fail back. And I'm going to do interface VLAN 20. And this will be 20, 20. And then I will say standby 20 with the priority here will be, uh, we'll say 60. Or you can put it at whatever value you want. It's up to you. And then I'll say preempt. So. I'm gonna go ahead and do show run real quick on those interfaces just so we can see what they look like. Down here at the bottom is where they're gonna show up. So as we can see, VLAN 10 has been set as the primary default gateway through HSRP. And then we have VLAN 10 is the preemptible one, which means that if switch six dies and then comes back online, when it dies, switch seven will take over for it. When switch six comes back online, it's gonna to say to switch seven, hey man, let me go ahead and take back over. And switch seven will be like, all right, cool. And then he will relinquish his capability and put it back on switch six. That's basically how the preemption piece works. It's pretty simple. Let me go ahead and do the same thing on switch seven. So interface VLAN 10, we're typing standby 10, IP will be 10.1.10.254. I'm gonna put the priority here of 60, and we're gonna put in uh, 10 preempt. And then interface VLAN 20, standby 20 IP of 10.1.20.254. We're gonna put in the priority of 255 and preempt. Okay. That's our HSRP config. It's pretty simple. And as you can see, the HSRP is starting to work. And if I was to jump out of global config and do a show standby brief, we can see that once it's done doing its figure it out stuff, there it goes. 
So what I'm saying for VLAN 10 is switch 7 is standby for VLAN 10, where VLAN uh, switch 6 is the active forwarder for VLAN 10. And then I'm going to come down to for switch or for VLAN 20, switch 7 is the active forwarder for VLAN 20, and switch 6 is the backup. So if something happens on switch 6 for VLAN 10, VLAN switch 7 will take over for it. When switch 6 comes back online, you can fail back. There are some caveats that go into play with this, but for the most part, it's pretty straightforward. So uh, I don't have it on my list of things to do, but I'm going to go ahead and configure DHCP on switch and switch six and switch seven for my PCs. So and I'll I'll let them grab their IP addresses through DHCP. So on switch six, I'm going to go ahead and get him squared away. He'll be a DHCP server, so we'll switch seven. So I'm going to type in IP DHCP and the pool. I'll give it a name. This will be VLAN ten. The network I'm going to set up for this guy is going to be 10.1.10.0 slash 24. The default router will be 10.1.10.254. And my DNS server will be quad 8. Something as simple as that. I'm going to do VLAN 20, same thing. The network will be 10.1.20.0. The default router will be 10.1.20.254. It's something like load balancing. Correct. Yeah, that's that's one way you could look at it for sure. And we'll set the DNS server to be quad eight. And I'm gonna say that IP DTP excluded address is gonna be ten dot one dot ten dot six through ten dot one dot ten dot seven. Oops, not no dash. And then I'm also going to put in here dot two fifty four, and then do the same thing for uh, twenty. Just like that. Now the cool thing about this is, is I can do show run pipe section DHCP, and I can literally just copy and paste this stuff out of the switch. It makes it that simple. So when you've got it configured like this, it's easy just to copy and paste it out. Grab it on one box, and then paste it into the other. Switch seven, just like this, and paste. All right, so now I'm just gonna go down to my PCs, and I'll type in IP will be DHCP. IP DHCP, and then you should see the door process kick in, and you should get an IP address through DHCP which he does, 10.1.10.1 with the gateway of 10.1.10.254. So on switch six, I'm gonna go ahead and do a, is it common to use layer three switches as a DHCP server? Um, it can be, yes. So you can put it on whatever box you want, to be honest with you. I just happen to be putting it in play here because it makes it easier to configure, but there's actually a number of companies that I work for that where they put it centrally and then you configure your default gateway, your SVI, you just point to the IP address of the DHCP server and you just do DHCP relay. Both will work. I'm just this is just easy for me to do. I'm going to do a debug of DHCP de uh, detail. So we're going to see the DHCP or server, I, debug IP DHCP server, and we'll say events. So I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing to PC12, but we're going to watch the communication go back and forth. I'm going to type in IP DHCP, and as it goes through the door process, we're going to see the IP addressing process go through the discover, offer, request, and acknowledge. And now he's got an IP address as well. All right, so PC13 is going to be the same thing. I'm going to go ahead and set the IP 
Let me go ahead and switch seven, do the same thing. I'm gonna jump out of global config and type in debug IP DHCP server events, PC 13. I'm gonna type in IP DHCP. He's gonna go through its process. And we can see the communication going out and going from there. If I jump back over to switch six, I do a show IP DHCP binding. We can see that there is some bindings and we can see that switch six is, happen, is uh, becoming the, the DHCP server. So we're still, if I was to do a show IP DHCP binding, we're seeing it on both. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, switch six is active. Switch seven is also seeing it, but eventually these will go away when the state of selecting is never bypassed or, or uh, you've never pa progressed past the state of selecting, eventually this will time out. But the reason why I have both of them configured is so that if switch six dies, switch seven will take over. Let's go ahead and PC, third, uh, PC 14 IP DHCP and that will be pretty much the, the end of the road for us with all this setup. All right, that, that's pretty much it, folks. That's really all that's left to it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do a ping to 10.1.20.254, and I should be able to ping my default gateway. Now, the question I have for everybody before we wrap up here is, will I be able to ping between my VLANs? That is a question that I have for all of you. Undebug all. And then undebug all. If we do a show IP route, I have connectivity setting up here. We do show IP route here. I have connectivity there. So the question I have is will I be able to do inner VLAN routing? Should I be able to ping between my VLANs? Let's go ahead and ping 10.1.10.254. I can ping that. I'm going to pause here for just a moment and let you guys weigh in on that. What do you guys think? Okay. You would think yes. That's a definitely an informed decision there, Pete. If you don't feel comfortable, or if you don't think it's gonna work, that's okay too. But I'm gonna go with Pete on this one. It should work. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna grab an IP address from PC13. You don't think it's gonna work? Okay, fair enough. I'm gonna grab this IP address right here. Come back over here to PC11. I'm gonna go ahead and ping, paste that in there. And I can absolutely ping between my VLANs. And the reason why I can is I'm gonna go ahead and grab my pen tool here and I'll do a little bit of whiteboarding here. I am right here on PC11. My default gateway is sitting up here of 10.1.10.254. Oops, that's supposed to be a four, not a nine. And then I've also got another default gateway of 10.1.20.254. And that's for PC 13. So what did I just show you guys on my switches, right? I have both of these guys in the routing table, right? And I have IP routing enabled. And no, I do not need to set up static routes in order for this to work. As long as you have connected subnets in your routing table, you have layer three capability. Layer three is 100% supported here, and we just did a ping between our VLANs. You don't need static routes to route between your VLANs. You just need to make sure that whatever device your gateway sits on, that especially if you're doing layer three switching or router on a stick, which we're not doing here, you need to be able to go up to your default gateway and route in between it. So what's happening here is I come in this way, 
Actually, let me let me erase this and make this a different color. This will be easier for you guys to see and to differentiate. Let me change this over to sky blue. Then I have PC13 sitting here. His his default gateway is 10.1.20.254. What's happening is when traffic from PC11 comes in, it hits the switch, goes up to this guy, and it's actually received in on this SVI. It comes in on 10.1.10.254, and a layer 3 lookup is done. What's the source? The source is 10.1.10.1. What's the destination? The destination is 10.1.20.1. Do I have a route for that? Yep, I sure do, right here. I have a route right there for it. That means that I'm going to be able to route from 10.1.10.254 to 10.1.20.254, and my traffic is gonna go down the link here and directly to PC3, or PC13. So yes, I can ping between them all day long. And that's what you need to keep in mind is as long as you have active routes, you'll be good to go. Now, if I have IP routing turned off or disabled, no inter VLAN routing. Inter VLAN routing will not work if I do not have IP routing turned on. And IP routing is what enables the layer three switching capability to do its job. That's how that comes into play. If you don't have IP routing turned on, layer three switching will not work. Make sense? Hopefully. Not clear, it's as clear as mud. We'll dive into this, into some more, we'll take a look at some static routing in the next section and dive into how that stuff works and all that good stuff that goes along with it. I have about eight minutes left on this session and then we're gonna uh, take a little bit of a break. We'll come back and we'll finish up. We'll do some basic basic routing. We'll set up some basic NAT. Can you set up ACLs on switch eight? Makes some sense to me, okay. Uh, Layer two ACLs, yes, on switch eight because there's no layer three IP addresses on switch eight. I could configure one. Uh, okay, you got it, good. Um, that's all good, man, that's, that's why you're here, right? So, uh, switch eight would not be able to do any layer three access lists unless there was a layer three interface. Well, then it would be s certain specific use cases, you wouldn't really, you, under, you understand? All right, cool. <laughs> I like the confirmation. So I would normally do, if I wanted to filter traffic between PC11 and PC13, I'd have to do that on the default gateway. I'd have to create a layer three ACL that's going to be associated to the SVI. We can talk about that more when we get into tomorrow's session. We're not gonna have time to do it today because I only have two more hours to go, but uh, that's basically how you can how you can set it up. So we will take a look at that tomorrow. Um, the rest of to, uh, the rest of today's session, uh, the next session that we're going to do, um, we're going to dive into. Let me go ahead and add to this. I'm gonna um, we're going to go and do uh, static routing. The concepts of that. We're gonna do um, basic NAT, or PAT, as you commonly refer to it. And then we're gonna get into the very basics of EIGRP. Pretty simple stuff, we'll go through that. Uh, tomorrow, I'm looking at doing uh, OSPF. I'm looking at doing um, ACLs and more detail, stuff like that. So if you guys have any additional questions on stuff, we can definitely cover those areas as we move forward 
and stuff like that. So um, unless there's more questions, I'm going to go ahead and call this session. I've only got a few minutes left, and we will circle back at about 3.30-ish. Um, we'll dive back into our next section and dive into all that stuff. Alrighty. So with that being said, I'm watching the preview. <laughs> There's a little bit of a lag. I wish I could get rid of that, but it is what it is. Alright, so with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up and we're going to be good to go. I will see all of you in about half an hour-ish, might be a little longer than that, but about half an hour. I will see. Will we be working on the same files for the next session or will it be a new one? Same file. Yep, and the cool thing about it is, is once the the videos are released or once I have the downloads, I will up them, upload them to YouTube. A YouTube. Yeah, for sure. And that's the whole benefit to the road.